We're continuing our consideration of the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, the second appearing. There's a second upon earth. There's a current appearing that is taking place. Jesus is appearing before God for us to make intercession for us. He's now appearing in the presence of God for us. What a blessed thing. That appearing validates his first coming and prepares for the second coming. Now tonight I want to move you a statement in Hebrews 9.28 that's made about this appearing that has a, it long intrigued me. For so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Mm -hmm. What I want to develop here is that when Christ initially came to the earth, he came to deal with sin. That's what he came for. Mm -hmm. He by his own confession said, I did not come to condemn the world. That's not why he came the first time. I did not come to condemn the world. In fact, he went on to say there in John 3, I did not come to judge the world. That's not why he came the first time. He came to deal with sin directly and effectively, to take it away. No one was going to make any progress toward God at all until sin was eliminated, taken away. So he did that. Now the second time, he's not coming to deal with sin. Amen. Sin is not the reason for his second appearing. Now Jesus will appear, he will appear visibly, <coughs> apparently, openly. Every eye shall see him. So this, this is proclaimed, there's no question about this. Every believer is responsible for getting ready for that event. If uh, no matter what you've done or how much you've advanced or how thorough you may conceive yourself to be, if you're not ready when Jesus comes, nothing else counts. Nothing else counts. But if you are ready, everything counts. That's the way it is in the divine economy. Now the doctrine of the second coming of Christ is not designed to frighten saints. That's not what it's designed to do. It's designed to comfort saints. Amen. Amen. In fact, when he speaks about Christ coming in the great climax of human history, I will be gathered together unto him. And he says, comfort one another with these words. So this is what we're going to say tonight. It comforts the saints. I acknowledge that it is uh, to anyone else it's not a comfort, but we're not here to comfort anybody. We're not here to comfort sinners. That's right. There isn't any kind of message that comforts sinners. God has never given a message that makes sinners at ease in Zion. There's no such message to make them comfortable. But there's a whole lot to make the saints comfortable. Amen. Praise the Lord. This is one of them. Amen. When he appears a second time, he will appear without sin. Now, I want to deal, first of all, with this issue of sin and how it was dealt with, because that's what gives such a power to this statement. He's going to appear without sin. Let's take a moment and define what sin is. Because the scriptures are rather precise in this. It comes at it from a variety of different <laughs> angles. 1 John 3, 4 says, Sin is the transgression of the law. Transgression of the law was uh, by doing something or by not doing something. By doing what he said not to do or not doing what he said to do. Sin is a transgression of the law. It crosses the line the law drew. Mm -hmm. So here's the line. Here's the standard for human conduct. No provision was made for deviating from that under the law. The law made no provision for breaking it. <laughs> Sin is a transgression of the law. That's one view. 1 John 5, 17 gives a little broader definition. It says, all unrighteousness is sin. So there are things that God really hasn't specifically condemned them, but there's still sin. If you do anything that's unlike God, what's unrighteousness? That's sin. All unrighteousness is sin. Like the thought of foolishness is sin, Solomon said. 
Even though the law didn't say thou shalt not have a foolish law, a foolish thought. The law didn't say that, but it still said the plowing of the wicked is sin. Mm -hmm. The scripture says, even though the law doesn't say the wicked shall not plow. It doesn't say that, but see, sin is all unrighteousness. <laughs> Anything unlike God is wrong. It's wrong because you're living in God's world. In a body God gave you with a canopy of grace over the top of you and the offer of salvation and anything unlike God is sin. All unrighteousness is sin. Romans 14.23 gives another definition of sin. There he's talking about doing things out of a sense of persuasion that it's right. And in that context he says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Now, there are some c contrived interpretations of that text, particularly from people from whom I have come, that uh, are not proper. It says that God, if God said it, it's of faith, and if you, whatever it is you do that God didn't say to do is sin. That's, that's not what this verse means. Instead, in fact, that's about as far from what it means as you can possibly get. What he's teaching there in Romans, the 14th chapter, is dealing with areas of uh, doubt and questions. One person said you could eat meat. One said you couldn't. One said one day was above another, more important than another. And one said no, every day is the same. And in that context, Paul says, listen, whatever you think about these areas that there's not specific instruction on them uh, that condemns or justifies the deed, be fully persuaded in your own mind. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He goes on to say, whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Give you thanks to God and the Father by Him. And whatever is not of faith, whatever doesn't proceed out of a desire to please God is wrong. Even though technically it may look right. It's wrong to live looking away from God. That's whatsoever is not of faith. It's wrong to do what isn't designed to please God. That's not of faith. So that's, that's a different definition of, of sin. James, he elaborates a little more specifically about it. James 1.15, he says, When lust, first he says it's a man's drawn away of his own lust and enticed, and when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. Mm -hmm. And sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. So in this case, sin is the fulfillment of an aberrant or wrong desire. You are, now you are assaulted with wrong desires every day of your life, and probably every hour of your life. You're, you're assaulted with desires that, that are not right. Some of them are fiery darts that are hurled at you by the devil in the form of thoughts that invade your mind. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you culture those thoughts and end up doing what they suggest, that's sin. So it's the fulfillment of uh, these thoughts. And make no mistake about this, that sin does separate from God. Whatever you think about God's love and God's grace and God's long-suffering and tenderness, the Lord says of Himself, Your sins have separated you from Me. That's Isaiah 59.2. Now, see, this teaches you that God had to deal with sin. God can't ignore sin. Even over a long period of time, 4,000 years to be precise, which is a rather, rather long time. Incidentally, while I'm right out of here on this point, one of the evils of the theory of evolution, one of the evils of it is a thread of thought that contaminates the human spirit is that the world is millions and billions of years old. Mm -hmm. And when you think in this kind of terminology, 4,000 years doesn't sound long at all. It sounds like just a little whiff of time. But it wasn't just a little whiff of time. Right. It was an extremely long test of God's long suffering. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you want to think of it in terms of days, not in terms of eons of time. For 4,000 years, God tolerated, for lack of a better word, sin. All the while knowing He had to deal with it. Sin in its entirety had to be taken away. He had to deal with it all at one time. 
God just didn't deal with sin like a like a uh, artist deals with a, making an image out of a rock, chiseling on it a little bit at a time. That he had to do it all at once. It had to be effective. It had to reach backward and cover every needed occasion, and it had to reach forward to the end of time. It had to be a thorough <coughs> deed. It had to outweigh thousands, probably millions, of sacrifices and shedding of blood. So when Jesus came, he came particularly to deal with sin. Amen. He did not come primarily to give us an example of how to live. Although he did give us an example of how to live, but that's not why he came. <coughs> David could have given us an example to live that Frankie could challenge most people. That's not why he came. He came to deal with sin. Now the scripture in particular about this, summarizing his life, Romans 4.25, says he was delivered for our offenses. That sort of took his whole life up to the cross. He was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification. That's why he came, to deal with sin. There come a time in his life when he zeroed in and this was his total focus. He refused to be dissuaded from it or turned from it. He set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem because that's where he was going to bury the iniquities of the world into an uninhabitable land. And he would not let anything turn his attention from that. Not leper, not woman of issue of blood, not hungry multitudes, not a needy person. Nobody turned his attention from that because that's why he came for that hour. On one occasion praying, he said, What shall I say, Father? Deliver me from this hour? For this hour came I into the world. He came to deal with sin. Romans 5, 6 says that he died for the ungodly. The point I'm making here is this is why he came. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 says Christ died for our sins. This is why he came. This is why that babe was born in Bethlehem why Mary conceived. His name was Jesus because he came to save his people from their sins. Matthew 1.21. We must rid ourselves in the church of this melancholy view of Jesus that somehow views him as either a superman or someone with a very tender heart toward the needy that that's why he came into the world. He was to be sure a super man from a one point of view. He was tender toward people and able to be touched with compassion by the multitude to be true. But that's not why he came. He could have done that from heaven and done something about that from heaven. He could feed poor people by birds bringing them flesh and bread. He could do that from heaven. But he could not take away sin from heaven. He had to come here to do that. He died for our sins. Again, God made him to be sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Corinthians 5, That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Now to make Him, made Him to be sin, you can read that from two different ways, and both of them are true. He first made Him a man in order that He might make Him sin, made Him to be. Or they, what He effectively did this, He made Him to be sin. He effectively did this. Why? This was His purpose. Sin had to be gathered into one person. All of it for God to deal with it. God would not deal with sin here a little, there a little. Deal with it in Moses. Deal with it in the prophets. Deal with it in you. This is not how God deals with sin. This is not how God deals with sin. God forgives your sin personally, yes. But see, forgiveness of sin wasn't the issue with God. It had to be removed. That was the issue with God. So we had to gather it all, put it into Christ, who bore our sins in his body on the tree. Again, Titus 2.14 states Christ's mission is this, to redeem us from all iniquity. The truth of the matter is, if Jesus is redeeming us from all iniquity, if that's true, there is no sin that can dominate you. The theory of addiction is erroneous. Amen. It's a psychological concoction that's not true. Deviant behavior does not happen because people are enslaved to it necessarily. 
Jesus has robbed sin of its power. He has redeemed us from all iniquity. And anyone who wants out from its dominion can come out from under it. Amen. That's the good news that we preach. Amen. Jesus did deal with sin. Effectively. And ever since he ascended and went back to heaven. And, and presented his blood, as it were, entered into the holiest with his own blood. Ever since that time, there's not a soul that has ever lived on the earth that believed this gospel and did not come out from under the dominion of sin. He came to deal with sin, and he did it effectively. And I like the statement of Revelation 1, 5. <coughs> he washed us from our sins in his blood. So the guilt of it's gone and the power of it's gone. We want also, uh, incidentally, we want to avoid any kind of presentation of the gospel that does not leave people with the idea that sin has lost its power. Your forgiveness is essential, but your forgiveness is a beginning. Just keeping pure, maintaining your purity. Yes is essential and if Jesus had not taken away sin you could not maintain purity Amen. but by the grace of God you can now well, so his first coming effectively dealt with sin now grace will teach you to say no to ungodliness and worldly lust or as the King James says to deny ungodliness and worldly lust the grace of God will teach you how to say this and how, how do you say that you say it by faith. That's how you say it. You say it knowing that Jesus has robbed sin of its power. He spoiled principalities and power. So he came to deal with sin. Now our text says that he's not going to do that the second time. That's not what, if you're going to get remission, you're going to have to get it before Jesus comes. There isn't going to be some other gospel preached after Jesus comes which is taught many places. There's not going to be another way to obtain remission after Jesus comes. He's not coming to deal with sin. That's not why he's coming. Now let's note for a moment for the blessedness of remission. It's the nature of God to forgive. That's his, that's his nature. But he has to have a just reason to forgive. God just can't forgive sin because he wants to. Now this uh, can get into some kind of a philosophical debate with the unlearned. Because there is something God wants to do but can't do. But see, God has a divine nature. Can't doesn't mean him, he doesn't have the ability to do it. He means it's contrary to his nature. God can't deny himself. He can't act contrary to his, to his own nature. See, you can. you can. You can act in contradiction of your basic nature. You can do that, but God... God can't. It's the nature of God to forgive. This is what he revealed to Moses in the Holy Mount. I must confess it. the words must, must, must have sounded sort of strange to Moses in that context. The faith of Moses is seen that he embraced this, even though it didn't, it didn't look like this was really the case. Exodus 34, 7, God speaking about himself, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, and transgression and sin then, then there's a comma and he says that will by no means clear the guilty it looks like it's a contradiction it's not a contradiction it's just two two parts of God's nature his righteous part says I want to forgive I forgive I forgive iniquity but there's a part of him that if iniquity is not dealt with by somebody external to the sinners, he, can, he can't do it. He can't, there's no way to just clear the guilt. There's no way to erase sin. <laughs> he can't erase it. He can't just forget it with an act of will, just forget it. It has to be dealt with, see? The blessedness of remission is that it's based, it's based on the fact that Jesus did really take sin away, all Amen. of it. He took Amen. it away, and you really can't sin without being deceived. It's really gone. Remission, let's it's at the entrance into salvation. Now there's there's been holy men all through the ages that sensed the the 
blessedness of remission, even though they didn't experience like we do in Christ. David said, Psalm 51, 9, Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out mine iniquities. Now that verse is what we call a Hebraism. A Hebraism was a Jewish form of poetry where they would say the same thing two ways and two different two different sides. And you'll find this quite frequently in Psalm and Solomon uses this in Proverbs quite often. He'll state the case one way, then he'll say the same thing another way. Now here's here's the first way that David stated, hide your face from my sins. Here's the same thing from another viewpoint, blot out mine iniquities. From this you see you get the idea that the psalmist he felt uncomfortable in God's presence with sin upon him. Which is, which is what anybody does. They feel, they just, as soon as you step into God's presence, if you're, if you're unclean, you're the first one to know it. Isaiah, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, said, I am a man of unclean yes. lips. Now, he wasn't going around saying that other places, but when he got in God's presence, he said, David sensed, I want to be clean in your presence, Lord. But yet he knew also in his heart that means my sins have to be blotted out. They've got to be ex removed, thoroughly removed. So he longed for that. Again, Isaiah 1.18, God uh, gives a little hint about redemption. It's come. Let's reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they be as crimson, they'll be as wool. Now that... If you were back in Isaiah's day, I don't know how exactly they regarded that, but it wasn't like we do. With them, it was more like a projection that we look forward to when this can happen. It was that kind of a view. We, we, oh, we want this to happen, but it, we sense it's not going to happen with animal sacrifices. Even David said, well, with sacrifices thou art not well pleased. He knew that. He knew there's got to be something else. Now, what, what Jesus came to do is with the something else that allowed sin to be actually remitted. Jesus, you remember, he announced to his disciples, this is the my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission. Now see, that isn't, he didn't, when they offered animal sacrifices, it wasn't for remission. That's not why they did it. In fact, when they went away from the sacrifices, Hebrews 10 says they were more conscious of their sin than they'd ever been before. It was a remembrance of sin. Acts 26, 18, Jesus personally commissions Paul, sends him out to preach, to open men's eyes, turn them from darkness unto light, and from Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. That was what he was to do. Announce this uh, glorious message. And you'll recall that uh, Romans 4, 7 says, Blessed are these whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. That's a blessed man that God can't see any sin in them. That's a blessed, blessed person. So there is a blessedness of remission. Now, our text says that when Jesus comes, he's going to come without sin. That is, here's the point. The point is to be confident when he comes that your, your sin, that you don't have sin. That's the thing that's going to make his second coming such a glorious occasion. John talked about this in 1 John 2, 28 and 29. Now, little children, abide in him that, in order that, when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him. It is coming. Yeah, that's the aim. That's the aim. If you know that he's righteous, if you know this, then you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. That is to say, you can do this. You can be confident before in his appearance. You can be God makes you righteous in Christ. He does you Amen. does away with your sin and makes you righteous so that when Jesus comes, you won't be shaken and trembling, you'll be shouting for joy. Amen. Even now, when you come in the presence of the Lord, remission of sin is, is essential. If you're going to come up before God in prayer, supplication, you've got to come with a pure heart, having your conscience purged from dead works. And your body is washed with pure water. That's Hebrews 10, 22. So even now, even now, as the old Puritans used to say, you practice the presence of God. You become accustomed to coming before God without the weight of a guilty conscience. <laughs> Do you know that some people never go to God 
except to have their conscience purged and, forget, and to be forgiven. That's like the only reason they come. Some other people, the only reason they come is crisis. There's a crisis. That's the only reason. But at some point, you've got to get to the point where coming into the presence of God is not always connected with guilt and defilement and crisis. That you're coming because you enjoy being in His presence. And you derive blessing from it. See, I'm showing that remission of sin is essential to coming into his presence. And his presence is going to reach its optimum or its apex when Jesus comes again. Amen. Amen. <coughs> now, Jesus comes, he's going to come not, not to deal with sin. Ultimately, we are the promises held out to us that ultimately we are going to be separated from all sinful contaminants. Mm -hmm. Now here's a confession that God's people make now <clears throat> while they're in the flesh, in the body. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. Well, that isn't going to be said after Jesus comes. That's going to be obsolete. It's going to be an obsolete statement. But Jesus isn't coming to deal with sin. See, when you're when you are released from the body, changed in a moment. If you're alive when Jesus comes in the flesh, you'll be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. You get a new body. If you if long time ago you died, you'll be raised incorruptible, gathered together with the Lord. When you are, there'll be no there'll be no sin. And for you, Jesus isn't coming even to deal with sin at all. He's coming to deal a blessing. <laughs> the ultimate blessing. So we'll not be faced with that, uh, with that situation of sin dwelling in me. Or we'll not be faced with having to say what I want to do, I don't do. What I don't do, I, I, want, I do. You'll not be faced with that dilemma. No one will be, say, will be saying when they see Jesus, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good things. You know, one's going to be saying that when Jesus comes. That's in him. That's looking. Remember, this is an aspect of Christ's coming that it describes the reaction of people looking for him, anticipating him, anxiously awaiting. This is, this is their experience. This, uh, the, the same appearance that's going to provoke this, looking for him and saying, no, here he is, and there's no, no sin. When you see Jesus, you'll not think of what a sin you did. <laughs> what a thought. Here he is in all of his glory. Then while you're in the flesh, the closer you get to God, the more contaminated you see yourself if, you're, if you don't see the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. You have a keen sense of your weakness. And when Jesus comes, you're not going to have a sense of your weakness. You're going to have a sense of your strength in Christ Jesus because he's not coming to deal with sin, without sin, for those that look for him. Same coming is going to condemn everybody else. Here we deal with sin. In fact, the scripture says if we say we have no sin, we just lied. That's all. Someone says, uh, I don't have sin. They just lied. You don't have to discuss it with them. They just lied. That's all. They're a liar. Cut and dry. There was some time, a uh, short while back, I was part of a Rather lengthy discussion on the among some ministers on um, whether you can go 24 hours without sin in a sin. Well, they just discussed this. They just discussed this, and they were really waxing eloquent with their philosophies. Can you go 24 hours without sin? And so finally, one of them asked, oh, "Brother Gibbon, what do you think?" I said, "I think you got too long of a time segment. I think you should strive to be without sin for like a minute. <laughs> Cut it down a little bit. You got to be a little too ambitious." Your, your, your definition of sin is too narrow. Mm -hmm. It's too narrow. If you know to do good and don't do it, that's sin. See, it's too narrow. Yeah, we, and if you say even for a, for a day, if at the end of the day you say, I have no sin, you lied too. Mm -hmm. This isn't the truth. Jesus is never going to say to anyone, well, Father, I don't need to intercede for Brother Joe today. He seemed to make it through safely for the whole day. So let's pass on to some other needy soul. No. What I'm showing you here is the blessedness of Jesus coming without sin. What a blessing that is. Because you've never known so much as one second of that kind of, of, that kind of experience. To where in God's presence you did not have any consciousness at all of sin. 
You'll just you have that kind of experience here while you're in the body. And uh, we are admonished if you confess your sins, it's faithful and just to forgive you. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ Amen. the righteous. And Jesus said, you pray this. Say, forgive us our trespasses. Pray that. He didn't say pray that when you need to. He said, just pray it all the time. And Christ's advocacy, advocacy is associated with sin. Right now, Jesus is dealing with sin. Not to take it away, but if any man sin, we have an advocate. He's dealing with people in a sinful situation. Amen. His people are contending with sin, and Jesus' advocacy has something to do with that. But when Jesus comes again, he's not going to be an advocate to, to obtain cleansing for his people. That's not why he's coming. The second coming is not associated with sin. Now, some of the other versions I thought I'd share with you. He shall come the second time without sin. That phrase, without sin. The New King James Version says, apart from sin. Not apart from sin in himself, apart from the issue of sin, is the point. New American Standard Bible says without reference to sin. So that's not what he's not coming back because of sin. Or he's not coming in, NIV says, to bear sin. He's not coming to deal with it again. He's not coming to deal with sin, New Revised Standard Version. Not to take away sin, New American Bible. New Jerusalem Bible says when he shall come, sin being no more. Mm -hmm. ah, so that's the sense. Because he took it away, why is he going to come to deal with what he took away? He's not going to, he's taking sin away. He did. It doesn't look like it, but he did. Well, it looks like it in heaven. Everybody in heaven knows this. It's the earth, the ones that had the problem. So he's not coming to deal with sin because he's already dealt with it and it's, it's not existent so far as God's concerned. You just have to get right with God now to experience that thing. Again, uh, not to carry any burden of sin or to deal with it, the Amplified Bible says. So, to those who look for him, God, through Christ, is not going to be dealing with your sin when he comes. Now, I understand that there uh, you may have some questions that arise. Like, well, what about giving account for all the deeds done in the body, whether the good or whether the evil? Well, you're going to do that, but it's, it's not going to be like you do now. It's going to be of a different order than now. Now, you're, now you have to deal with those things, but there, when you acknowledge everything you did, you're going to be justifying God. Giving an account to God, we're, we're going to, in our account... To God, those who are in Christ, they're going to add in their accountability say, but Jesus took that away and I, I renounced sin by the grace of God. I by faith believed in the Lord Jesus. See, and that's going to, that's going to be the type of accountability you're going to give before God. He's not going to come to confront you with your transgression. I can remember when I didn't know this. And I, I want to know it more clearly now, but I can remember when the thought of Jesus coming and me confronting him was scary. I wasn't like a child either. I was a mature young man in my early 20s. And this was a frightening experience to me. Because I knew, I knew there's things I'm dealing with that I don't want in my life. I was quite honest in dealing with them. I wasn't a willful type transgressor. And still I'm not. But I knew there were things I had to deal with. But here's, here's the promise of Christ coming. You, you, you will struggle against sin. Make no mistake about it. And by the grace of God, you're going to have to deny thoughts you had. You're going to have to deny them. And you're going to have to abstain from worldly lusts that you, that you had. You're going to have to abstain from them. And there's sort of a defiling effect yes. that they have upon you even now. It's like the things you're ashamed of that you thought of that you really didn't want to think of, but they still are a source of shame. But they won't be when Jesus comes. That's the point. The difficulty is you are to have a treasure in an earthen or clay pot, this body. And that's what is the source of shame and uncomfortableness in the presence of God. But all that's going to be gone. When Jesus comes again, he's not going to come to confront you with your transgression. He's not going to appear to condemn you. Now, I know that the uh, 
untaught soul will say, well, does that mean then that I don't have to worry about sin now? Well, that's, no, that's, that's not the point. This is presuming that you're serious about Christ. Yes. This is presuming that you've believed on Christ and that you've availed yourself of the atonement and that you're fighting a good fight of faith. This is assuming that you're running the race set before you. It's assuming that you're wrestling against principalities and powers. It's talking to these kind of people. Because you can't look for Jesus to return and sin at the same time. You can't do this. When I was uh, 16 years old, and I, had, I returned to the Lord, bless God, after a very deviant departure, that extended over a period of time. And uh, one other person in the school that I attended, one other person in the whole school felt like I did about Christ. Nobody else did. And we were, it wasn't a small school. Everybody else was comfortable in the world. We were the only two that weren't. Well, a big issue came up about whether we should attend the what was called the sock hop which was a j dance in the gymnasium where you took off your shoes so you wouldn't damage the floor. <laughs> and they had these after all the sports and we were both five-letter athletes so we were all involved in the sportsmen so the fellows. So the question was, should we go to the sock hop? Well, we, we tried to reason it out. We couldn't, uh, we couldn't come to a conclusion so we asked another person that was learned in the ways of the Lord what he thought about it. What do you think about it? Well, he said, here's what I asked myself. I say, is this like where I want to be when Jesus comes again? We never had any trouble with the question after that. I can guarantee you it doesn't make any difference if you've been a Christian for 10 days or if you've been one for 50 years. If you will ask yourself this question, is this where I want to be when Jesus comes? You will always know the answer. Because you will be somewhere when Jesus comes again unless you've died. See, when Jesus comes, he's not going to come to deal with sin. And his first coming dealt with it. And if you deal with sin now in Christ, you won't have to deal with it then. Amen. And it's a blessed, uh, you can end each day with a, with a clean slate. You can do it. Because there's provision for remission. You can take your case to the Lord. You can confess your sin. You've already got a, you've got a word, you've got a two-handed promise from the Lord. If we confess our sins, we just ask you to acknowledge it. Just admit it. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and... Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's just take this proclivity or inclination away from us. That's how you get ready for the coming of the Lord. See, you can't live a life of faith sporadically. On, off. Bright, dark. Hot, cold. <laughs> you, because Jesus could come at the cold time. You, you don't want that. You want to live in a lively awareness of Christ, looking for His appearing. And he, now you've got this promise. You've got this promise from the God of glory. To those who look for him, he will appear without sin. That's the promise. So what do you do? You work on looking. That's what you do. You work on anticipating. And every man that has this hope in him <clears throat> purifies himself. And you'll be ready. You'll be ready when he comes. The scriptures tell us that then... We'll be glad with exceeding joy. First Peter 4.13. We'll be glad with exceeding joy. And I, I don't believe anyone will be able to say when Jesus comes, I've lived perfectly spotless for the last month, Lord. Thank the Lord. I don't think anyone will be able to say that, really. But when he comes again, if you've availed yourself of the atonement, he came to... Jesus came to deal with sin, and he's still dealing with your sin now. Not with getting it away from God, getting it out of you. That's what he's doing now. And if you avail yourself of that now, you've got this promise. He'll come again not to deal with sin. What, well, what is he going to deal with as far as you're concerned? He's going to conform you to his image. <laughs> he's gonna, 
You're going to be changed to be like him. That's what he's going to do for you. They're Amen. looking for him. He'll change you. Change you to be like him. Conform to his image. And here, here's what he's going to do for you. You'll be found without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Amen. You'll be found faultless before his throne. You'll be found without blame. Ephesians 1 4. How is it that that can happen? You looked for his return. Hmm. When you looked, you prepared. Because you sensed, got to be ready for that appearing. So this is the meaning of the text. He shall appear the second time without sin. For those who are looking, looking for him, anticipating him. There's going to come a time, now we look forward to this, there's going to come a time when the shout's going to come from the throne, Revelation 21, 6, It's done! It is done! And what we just read about tonight will be done. <laughs> when there comes a time. Jesus is pictured as sitting on a cloud now with a sickle in his hand. A reaping sickle. And it's going to come a day when Revelation 14 says he's going to thrust his sickle into the earth and the earth's going to be reaped. But another he's going to gather the wheat into his barn. <laughs> and joy is going to come in the morning. Mm -hmm. It is. Weeping may, it may, may not too. Weeping may endure for the night. But joy comes in the morning. And they that sow in tears will reap in joy. What does that mean? Reap in joy. Joy comes in the morning. Glad with exceeding joy. Because when Jesus comes, it's going to be without sin. <laughs> He's not going to bring a bag of your sins back. Say, hey, here you are. Here's what you did. That's not what He's going to do. He's going to bring your inheritance back with Him. Say, here you are. <laughs> Here's what I redeemed you for. Here's what, here's what I came back to give you, the full inheritance. And blessed be God, when that day, when that day happens, we will be the happiest people, I will tell you. But on the meantime, you, uh, you deal with your own sin now. Do it faithfully. Avail yourself of the intercession of Christ, the advocacy of Christ, the blood of the atonement. Do so now. You have to do it on a daily basis. This is not something you do once a week or so forth. Do it. Become a very acutely aware of your deficiencies and let them drive you to the Lord for cleansing. And then Jesus gives you this promise. You live by faith. You walk in the Spirit. You, may, you, may, you avail yourself of the, of the blood of the covenant. Avail yourself of it now. And when He comes, so far as you're concerned, it'll be without sin.